Thank you. Uh, first of all, let me join all of you in uh, congratulating DC Books on this extraordinary achievement, you know, uh, for a publishing house of this quality, publishing such a wide range of books. Uh, to complete 50 years uh, is quite deeply, deeply impressive. And I'm greatly privileged to be giving this lecture. When Ravi invited me to give this talk, I made a resolve to myself that I would keep politics out of the talk because this is a celebration of literature. So it may be that a few people in the audience, perhaps an energetic reporter or two looking for some, uh, uh, knowing my, my penchant for controversial statements, uh, but I was absolutely resolute that I will Politics will figure indirectly in my talk, but there will be no mention of a politician dead, living, or unborn. And uh, I was uh, confirmed in my, in my decision when I saw this extraordinary galaxy of some of the finest living writers in our country assembled here. So there is Sarah Joseph, there is Sachidanandan, there is M. Mukundan, there is T. D. Ramakrishnan, there is Santosh Kumar, and there is my friend Benjamin hiding somewhere in a corner, typically, uh, in the audience. Now, and this is just a few of the writers whom DC Books has published. And uh, just a few of the very, uh, oh, 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 you know, over the generations. So I, you have, I mentioned six names. They have three things in common. That separate them from me. One, they write in their mother tongue. Uh, two, they are all from this state. And three, they are all creative writers. So they are five novelists and a poet. Now, I am a historian, and I say this with absolutely no, no false modesty. I am not a creative writer. I am a craftsman. And I'll, but I still thought that I would talk about the relationship between history and literature, and not on politics, not on society. Uh, and I divided my talk into two parts. The first part is called Literature as History. When we read creative writers, when we read poems, short stories, plays, novels, we are reading it, I hope, and I think these writers also hope, largely for aesthetic reasons, for the pleasure it gives you in the crafting of a sentence, a paragraph, in evo evoking a mood, in a Maybe for psychological reasons, the way characters and relationships are depicted. Of course, there are some writers who are overtly political, but uh, that's secondary. I don't make up things, but I believe that although most creative writers see their craft, uh, see their vocation as art, not as political intervention explicitly, Yet, they are telling us something about the society and the culture and the times they live in. So that's the first part of my talk, literature as history. The second part of my talk is history as literature. Can a craftsman like me actually produce literature? You know, uh, usually we can produce, we think, scholarship. We can write serious books that are recommended in university curriculum that inspire PhD students. But can we also make our work intelligible, accessible to a wider audience? And can we write elegantly? When can history become literature? So that's the second part of my talk. So first part of my talk, literature as history. And as I briefly mentioned, if you take a poem, a novel, a play, beyond its aesthetic and psychological and emotional and literary qualities, a creative work of fiction also may and often does tell you something about the play of social forces, about political conflicts, about changing economic and technological uh, you know, uh, processes. And it, I'm going to give a couple of illustrations from poetry, where poetry becomes history. And I'm going to choose two poems written in two different languages about the trauma and dilemma of partition. Now, 
people in Kerala are far away from partition. I am a little closer in Bangalore, but still very distant from the real epicenters of partition, which were northern and eastern India, and to some extent western India too. And partition, that event of 19, August 1947, what preceded it, what came after it, the terrible religious violence and the suffering of the refugees has been memorialized, immortalized uh, in dozens of books, you know, scholarly books, political tracts, uh, novels, but also in poetry. And poetry uh, has, a, has a way of uh, distilling complex experiences in a few telling words. You know, uh, and I, so I'm going to read you two excerpts from poems about partition. The first poem uh, is by the great Urdu poet Faiz Ahmed Faiz. Uh, and it's an excerpt from his poem, Subaha e Azadi, The Dawn of Freedom. And it's translated by uh, the historian V.G. Kiernan, who was a British historian who in the 30s and 40s taught in government college Lahore and picked up enough Urdu to translate not only Faiz but also Iqbal. In fact, the two canonical English language collections of the poetry of Faiz and Iqbal are translated by B.G. Kiernan. So this is a translation of a section of Faiz's poem, <coughs> Subha e Azadi. I read, this leprous daybreak, dawn's fangs have manged. This is not that longed for day, not that clear dawn in quest of which our comrades set out, believing that in heaven's wide void, somewhere must be the star's last halting place. Somewhere the verge of night's slow washing tide, somewhere the anchorage for the ship of heartache. So those who fought for freedom, like Fares and DCK Kamoni and many others, hope for a, a utopia, a country of happiness, of beauty, of pleasure, of joy. And what, instead of which they got this divided country, rawn and rent by civil and religious strife. But that's the first poem of short excerpt from Fares that captures uh, the traumas of partition. The other poem is by an English poet, a very great English poet, W.H. Oren, who actually never visited this country. Uh, and yet here he is writing a poem about another Englishman, the judge called Cyril Ratcliffe, who was tasked by Mountbatten with drawing the boundary lines in Bengal and Punjab. In those two provinces, Cyril Ratcliffe, who had never come to India before, came in and drew the line. What will become Pakistan? What will become India? And after he left, Auden wrote a poem about Cyril Ratcliffe, and I'm just going to uh, quote you a short excerpt. Shut up in a lonely mansion with police night and day. It's a description of Ratcliffe and how he drew those lines in the Punjab and in Bengal. I repeat, shut up in a lonely mansion with police night and day patrolling the gardens to keep assassins away. He got down to work to the task of settling the fate of millions. The maps at his disposal were out of date. And the census returns almost certainly incorrect. But there was no time to check them, no time to inspect contested areas. The weather was frightfully hot, and a bout of, di and a bout of dysentery kept him constantly on the trot. But in seven weeks, it was done. The frontier decided, a continent for better or worse divided. The next day, he, that is Ratcliffe, the next day, after drawing this boundary, the next day he sailed for England, where he quickly forgot the case, as a good lawyer must. Return he would not, afraid as he told his club that he might get shot. Now, one is a grim, bitter, sad poem by Fares. The other is a kind of sardonic, sarcastic, uh, cynical poem by Auden. But look at how they 
capture the traumas and dilemmas of partition. Now, this is what literature can do for history. This is the first part of my talk. Literature as history. Uh, it can illuminate the past in telling ways. I spoke about poetry. Now, let me say a little bit about, about novels. Uh, when the pandemic happened, all of us had to find ways of passing our time. We couldn't travel, we couldn't meet friends, we couldn't play games, we couldn't go for walks. We had to find ways of, new ways of passing our time. And I decided, my son told me, uh, that he told me, why don't you read Leo Tolstoy's novels? Now, it so turns out that, as some of you know, I've written a two-volume biography of Mahatma Gandhi, which DC Books has published. And Tolstoy was one of Gandhi's icons. Uh, however, Gandhi was deeply influenced by Tolstoy's philosophical and religious writings. His book, The Kingdom of God is Within You, his essay collection, Confessions, his autobiographical reflections on why he embraced celibacy in midlife. And Gandhi followed Tolstoy in living simply, in not being a religious fundamentalist. Uh, and all this came from his philosophical writings. But I knew, as a biographer of Gandhi, that there is no evidence that Gandhi read either War and Peace or Hannah Karenina. Uh, so I said, let me set myself a challenge. As a biographer of Gandhi, go further than Gandhi. So I read these two books, 30, 40 pages a day. And of course, they were riveting. They've been beautifully translated. And the whole world of 19th century, Russia unfolded in front of me. Not only were the characters like Pierre in War and Peace and of course Anna and Anna Karenina, but also uh, the story of Tsarist Russia, the emergence of dissent against absolutism, the Napoleonic Wars. So it was literature as history. So I was telling my daughter that I was reading Tolstoy. And she said, typical of you to only read a male novelist. So why don't you read George or Eliot now? So that's what I did next. I picked up Middlemarch. And to my eternal shame, I was dead. When the pandemic broke, I was already 60. And I had never read three of the greatest novels ever. And it had not been for my son. I would have not read Tolstoy. I have not been for my daughter. And Eliot's Middlemarch is, dare I say, of the same quality as, as War and Peace. As a work of literature, it's evocation of character. Who can ever forget the dry as dust Cosabon? You know, uh, once you, uh, you learn about him. Uh, but it's also a story of, of the changes in England, the granting of the vote, uh, the transformation of an agrarian society into an industrial society. And more recently, I said, I've read about Russia. I've read about 19th century Russia. I've read about 19th century England through these great novels. And I picked up a novel about 19th century Germany, which I finished last month. Thomas Mann's Budenbrooks, which is a story about a bourgeois family, a rich family, that goes from riches to rags in three generations. Now, these are examples of literature as history. You know, uh, <coughs> novels, plays, uh, poems that are written, as I insisted in the beginning, for aesthetic and artistic reasons, but really unfold the whole world in front of you. Now, if you take your state, Kerala, in the last century and a half, this state has undergone at least half a dozen transformative revolutions. Uh, there was the anti-imperial revolution. So the British were removed by freedom fighters. Uh, there was the anti-feudal revolution, which was aimed at large landlords, at princes and chiefs, to create a more egalitarian economic order. Uh, there was the anti-patriarchal revolution. And Kerala, of course, has been in the forefront of women's emancipation. There was the anti-caste revolution, you know, uh, uh, pioneered by people like Narada Guru, where the obnoxious hierarchies and discriminations of the Hindu caste order 
were challenged and substantially overcome. So that Kerala went from more or less the most caste society state in India in 100 years to being relatively egalitarian. Of course, not completely egalitarian. And then you have the demographic revolution. Which is not just decline in fertility, uh, not just uh, uh, education of women, it's also the migration to the Gulf. Now, if you, there's a democratic revolution, a demographic revolution, and then there's a democratic revolution. The creation of a multi-party competitive political system based on universal adult franchise, which would be inconceivable to a Malayali in the 30s or 40s that this could happen. Now, here are these multiple revolutions taking place. Now, many Kerala historians have written about it. There were some very eminent social, political, economic historians. They have written large tomes full of tables and uh, data and with lots of footnotes to Karl Marx and Lenin. Now, those are also valuable. I'm not saying they don't have their place. But another way of understanding the extraordinary multiple revolutions that your state has undergone in the last 150 years is to read the works of the writers in this room, the writers in other parts of Kerala, and the creative writers of other parts of Kerala, the writers, who are the writers of the 19th century who are no longer with us. So, <coughs> literature, whether produced in the form of a play, a poem, a short story, or a novel, can indirectly, I emphasize indirectly, because the main aim of the creative writer is art. It is not propaganda, it is not education, but indirectly works of literature can provide an insight into wider social, cultural, political, economic, environmental histories. This brings me to the second part of my talk, which is history as literature. Can a historian like myself uh, presume or uh, have pretensions to contributing to literature? Now, in the course history as a discipline, of course, it goes back to the ancient Greeks. You know, arguably, the first historians were ancient Greeks, Plutarch, Herodotus, Thucydides, who wrote about wars. But as a modern discipline, it's really a, it's really a 19th century phenomenon. And as it has evolved over the last 100 years, uh, history has oscillated uncertainly between literature and social science. So there are two poles uh, between which history travels. One is to communicate. You know, the historians of the 18th century, uh, Europe, you know, Gibbon, who wrote Decline and Fall of uh, uh, the Roman Empire, or of the early 19th century, like the French historian Michelet, who wrote about the French Revolution, they saw themselves as writers, not as novelists, not making up things, basing their work on rigorous research, but as writers writing fine prose, as also as literators. But after the coming of modern social science, at the coming, I mentioned Marx. Marx was a great thinker. You know, uh, I don't agree with Marxist politics, but that's a separate question. But Marx was a great thinker. It was Marx who first showed what a transformative, transformative role technology plays in our society. You know, if you want to understand all the good and the awful things that this phone does, Marx is a good place to start because Marx said a new technology is an autonomous social actor. You don't know the steam engine will come, the motor car will come, you don't know what impacts it will have. Uh, but also you had Marx's great contemporary Max Weber, who's an equally significant sociologist, who uh, coined terms such as charismatic leadership to describe a leader's hold over the public, who argued, unlike Marx, that inequality was not just based on economics. It was also based in, on status and power. It's, it's also based on status and power. So a Weberian sociologist would have a much keener interest in caste, because for, unlike the Marxists, for whom class is everything. But what Marx and Weber did, 
they gave historians a vocabulary of concepts caste cla class power authority technological dynamism the role of the state and history tended more and more towards social science it was it abstracted itself from the lives and struggles of ordinary individuals and started writing works that tried to make sociological political and occasionally philosophical sense of how the society was changing and some of it was very important because history is not telling stories history is also history is both literature and social science but it may be that of the course of the 20th century historians became very academic extremely sociological started using technical language and they separated themselves from the public with whom they used to once communicate so how can historians how can historians retain an analytical sharpness that social science gives them but yet also have a supple list of language can history i talked about literature as history can history become literature and in my last the last few minutes of my talk what i'll suggest to you is that one way in which historians can also contribute to literature not just to scholarship not just to political or sociological analysis is through the art form or uh, i beg your pardon not the art form the genre of historical writing known as the biography now if i was to uh, write about you know a historian would generally write uh, uh you know about the many books on transformations in the caste system of kerala but what if you were to write a book only about one anti caste reformer or about only one particularly conservative priest now recently we celebrated uh, the centenary of the vaikom satara and of course uh, 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 we still await i mean they, i'm i'm told there's some very fine books in malayalam on narayana guru but i haven't read a good biography in english and i hope that comes but you could also write a biography of the nambudri priest of the temple you know uh, just a, a, a kind of uh, uh, if you write about an individual your your if you write about a process if you write a book called, if you write a book called the politics and sociology and law of the vaikam satyagraha you are writing for academics but if you write about one individual who who embodies the vaikam satyagraha either as a enforcer of caste orthodoxy like a particular nambudri priest or as a challenger to caste orthodoxy like a like either dharana guru or you know one or two of the activists who are involved there then you are writing about human beings so you are actually writing about caste writing about politics writing about the law but in ways in which since you are approaching your subject through an individual at that individuals sentiments emotions relationships you are coming closer to a novelist or a short story writer but you are not inventing a biographer has been described as an artist under oath an artist under oath i still think that a biographer is a craftsman I underline i don't think we are artists the people on this they are artists and some of the people in the audience are artists i am a craftsman but when you move towards biography you moving slowly towards literature because you're writing about human beings in flesh and blood now i have written many biographies several biographies and i talked about gandhi but i'd like to if i may end my talk with two with two uh on my less known biographical experiments uh what was the first biography i ever wrote which is about a maverick british anthropologist called verrier elvin now elvin played a very important role in my life i was a student of economics a spectacularly mediocre mediocre student of economics in delhi university and in my five years ba and ma i had never got uh, anything except a second class and you know obviously your parents would like you to be 
a first class student uh, but there is also a certain glamour it becomes a third class student because you don't care but even in the middle a second class student you really you know you should look for something else and so happens that while i was in the last year of my ma i read the autobiography of very elvin and i was enchanted by the story of this man uh, here is a man born in 1902 in england the son of a bishop of the anglican church who studies in oxford gets two first class degrees unlike me and reads about india comes to india in 1927 leaves the church joins gandhi works with gandhi leaves gandhi and then goes to the what is now the district of mandla in madhya pradesh and spends his lifetime working among adivasi people an english scholar from oxford becomes the foremost anthropologist and activist on behalf of tribal rights and he writes a dozen superb ethnographies and he was a wonderful writer he practiced anthropology and literature at the end of his life he wrote his autobiography which i read and i said he economics is not for me i am not for economics let me move towards social anthropology which is what i did a phd in and from there i moved to history so i wrote about this man and his journeys and that was the first biography i wrote which is called savaging the civilized uh, <coughs> which was published 25 years ago now while writing that book i came across uh i found that there were many things and in elvin's autobiography by the way got the sahitya academy award the sahitya academy award for english the central sahitya academy award for english and there are several people here who are sahitya academy award winners is very rarely given for a work of non fiction as you know it's given for poetry and and fiction and elvin was the first writer to get the english award for an autobiography so it's a beautifully written book but the more the research i did the more i found that the guy is telling you a lot but he is hiding even more there is nothing about why he broke up with gandhi there is nothing about his first wife you know uh, how he was got into trouble with the authorities repeatedly and when i wrote my book which is not it was about it was based on elvin's letters and documents and archival sources i realized that an autobiography is interesting for what it says and what it does not say i mean later when i worked on gandhi and i read experiments of truth i came to the same conclusion but more importantly an autobiography should be viewed as what i call a preemptive strike against a future biographer so you are getting your story out before a biographer comes to you you know so treat every autobiography of a famous writer politician scientist with suspicion they try to ward off a future biographer but if the future biographer is diligent enough they can find things more interesting more unusual they can find that their subject actually led a much more colorful life that is all presentation of that life tells you and that book i wrote in elvin actually means much more to me than books of mine that i may have sold more or got more awards and so on my second biographical experiment and then i'll end with that was of a cricketer and a cricketer uh, some of you know i am deeply interested in cricket but this is a cricketer who i was had heard of before he was a man called palwankar balu now i knew of him because i am a historian of cricket and i knew that he was india's first great spin bowler in the year 1911 more than a century ago before india was granted official test playing status at all india team toured england and we didn't have official test playing status but we played against all the counties so we played first class matches at all india team it was captained by the maharaja of patiala and it lost most of its matches because in india was just finding its feet as a cricket playing pa but this one man palwankar balu got 150 wickets and he was offered county contracts so i knew about this person through my researches in cricket history that he was a great spin bowler you know before bishan singh bedi before ravindra jadeja before vinu mankad the first great indian left arm spinner 
was a man we had forgotten called Palwankar Balu. Now, I knew that part of Balu from my life as a cricket writer. Now, in my life as a historian, I was beginning my research on Mahatma Gandhi, and I started reading about the famous Pula Pact of 1932, where Gandhi and Ambedkar uh, had a famous disagreement about affirmative action for Dalits, which lied, resulted in a compromise called the Pula Pact. And that pact is still discussed by historians of the Dalit movement. And while I was doing research on this pact, the name of Palwankar Balu came in. And Balu, I found, was a mediator between Gandhi and Ambedkar, which was decidedly puzzling. You know, what was a great cricketer doing mediating between two political leaders? You know, Virat Kohli and MS Dhoni are not going to mediate between BJP and Congress today. And then I realized that Balu was a Dalit. Not only was he a Dalit, he was the first Dalit public figure from Western India because of what he did in the cricket field. Uh, and he was an early hero of Ambedkar's. And Ambedkar's first public appearance was when Balu got 150 wickets on the 1911 tour. And the team came back on ship, by ship to Bombay. There was a felicitation by the depressed classes of Bombay. And Ambedkar, who was then a brilliant BA student of Bombay University, gave the speech felicitating Balu. So I started digging up more and more about this man. And I found that he was a Dalit. He had to struggle incredibly hard. Cricket was played on religious lines. The most important tournament in Bombay was well before the Ranji Trophy and the Indian Premier League, something called the Quadrangular, which was played between Europeans, Hindus, Muslims, and Parsis. And Balu was the finest Hindu cricketer, but he was never made a captain because he was a Dalit. And so I, and of course, unlike, unlike Elvin, he wrote no letters, he wrote no books. Uh, there was no autobiography. And I yet had to reconstruct his story uh, from newspaper accounts, from tracks in Marathi. And I, I wrote a book which is called Call of a Foreign Field, which is mostly about the intermingling of caste and politics in the early decades of the 20th century, before Narayana Guru, before Ambedkar. Now, this, these two experiments with biography, writing the life of Elvin, and trying to reconstruct the life of this extraordinary Dalit sporting icon, uh, taught me two lessons, or several lessons, and I'll just Enumerate, uh, I'll enumerate the more important ones. Uh, they are that the most interesting people in the, to write a life about, a biography about, are not the most famous. They're people in the middle. You know, uh, and many, many writers would fall, uh, fall in that category. For example, if I was to look at writers, dead writers. I mean, I don't believe anyone should write a life of a living person. You know, I myself have been, have got, uh, after I wrote on Gandhi and I wrote on Elvin, have been asked to write lives of, I've, I've been asked to write lives of people. I've got commissions, in, interestingly, unsolicited commissions, one in 1999, to write a life of Atal Bihari Vajpayee, which it was easy to decline. And a second, that was after my Elvin book came out, and after the first volume by Gandhi biography came out, I got a second commission, which was to write a biography of Gautam Adani, and that was even easier to decline. So I don't believe one should write lives of living people. But if you write a life of dead person, I think people like Elvin and Balu, who are in between, are really interesting. Now, I don't know much about Kerala. Uh, but as a resident of Karnataka, as someone who spent his formative years in Kolkata, I would love to have a life of Shivaram Karan and Mahashwata Devi. Because they were not, you know, they were great writers, but they were not hermits. They were not, you know, uh, 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 you know shut up in a room. They were active in society, in culture, uh, in politics. They were controversial. They did great things. They also did stupid things. You know, Shivaram Karan was a towering figure. Uh, he pioneered the modern Kannada novel. 
he revived the ancient dance drama of yakshagana uh, he was a remarkable environmentalist which is the capacity in which i met him but i have told he also saw himself as a renaissance man so he wanted to make films and his films i have told are utterly dreadful so you would have to write a life of shivaram karant but through shivaram karant the whole history of more than uh, you know ramkrishna hegde or devraj ars uh, or nijalingappa it is shivaram karant through whom you can tell the tell the story of modern karnataka and the other person would be mahashita devi you know through her life and there are some people here i'm sure who knew her i knew her briefly not well through her life you know from a up, from a brahmin brahmin a woman who faced gender discrimination at the same time was a beneficiary of caste privilege because she was a brahmin from a very aristocratic brahmo family who knew tagore and yet she started working about adivasis and uh, wrote some important novels uh, was a extraordinary interesting charismatic figure till the end of her life was discovering writers i don't know whether you know the story of how she discovered the brilliant dalit writer manoj byapari who was actually riding a rickshaw with mahashita was was riding now you could say much more about the history of post colonial bengal to the life of mahashita devi that you could to the life of jyoti basu so i think that's the first uh, first kind of broad lesson i learned that it's more interesting to write about people who are not really powerful not really influential to write about people who are unusual interesting eccentric and straddle many worlds many different worlds the other lesson i learned and that's where i end is that although uh, i uh, i could never write a novel or a poem and if i did it would be utterly unreadable if i was to attempt to move my discipline of history closer uh, to the art of literature if i was to attempt or to try or to hope or to expect that my discipline of history moves closer to the art of literature that the genre of biography uh, is the way to go so uh, uh, and i would end with this and with uh, the hope that publishers like dc books uh, as they go forward will of course publish the greatest uh, poets playwrights novelists and short story writers in every language not just malayalam but they will pay attention to the fine young scholars writing wonderful biographical studies too thank you